start. It's just past uh, 10 a.m. here in Brisbane. Thank you to everyone who's joined us and um, especially uh, Professor Alison Doherty from Canada. And we'll begin, um, yeah, this is our final SAGE event of the year. It's been a wild year to launch our Sport and Gender Equity at Griffith uh, Research Program, but it's been wonderful to use technology to be able to connect with people all over the world and get more input than we probably would have been able to do. So that's been wonderful. We'll just start with um, an acknowledgement of country. Yeah, Griffith University acknowledges the traditional custodians on the land on which we're meeting and pays respect to the elders past, present and extends that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. And here on the Gold Coast, it's the Coomba Bear people. And I just also wanted to acknowledge that here in Australia, it's NAIDOC week and that I think that there's been a real spotlight put on um, Indigenous people in sport recently with the Black Lives Matters um, protests. And there is more opportunity for us to do more, particularly um, around uh, Indigenous women who are very marginalised. So um, that's something that we can continue to work on and you know, it, it hopefully encourage more students from who have Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander um, background to, to do exciting research in this area. So just general housekeeping as usual, please keep your microphones on mute so that we can avoid background noise. Uh, there will be time for questions at the end. Uh, please use the chat and I will moderate the best way I can. I recently went to a session where um, rather than writing the questions in, people just um, put a little, uh, said, you know, me or I have a question so that when it came time, I knew who to go to to ask questions. So yeah, you might want to try that and that way you can ask the question. And, and that also means that if somebody's answered your question previously, you can adjust it. So, but I'm happy to uh, try all different things. Uh, please be respectful and inclusive and use inclusive language. Abuse will not be tolerated in this forum. So we just will, um, yeah, reserve the right to remove people. Okay, um, follow us on Twitter uh, and yeah, feel free to tweet today's session. We will be recording this session and posting it on our YouTube channel as well. And Welcome to today's uh, panel, which is Sport and Recreation Policy Responses in a Post-Pandemic World, Equity and Innovation in the New Normal. And we're really excited to have such a great range of speakers. Um, we've got Emma Stoneham, who will go first, who's Senior Advisor to the CEO, Program Lead, Women Leading Sport at Sport Australia. Then after that will come Sarah Lovell and Tiani Van Haren from Sport and Recreation Queensland. Then Professor Alison Doherty at the School of Kinesiology, Faculty of Health Sciences at Western University, Ontario, Canada. And finally, our very own Professor Simone Fulliger, who's Chair of the Sport and Gender Equity Research Hub here at Griffith. So... Without further ado, so Emma will be going first and I will, um, we will be starting with, um, I'm just going to uh, have a little video here. Okay, technologies, not that smooth, but we'll get there. Uh, where is that thing? Here it is. And we're going here so everybody can see this. Okay. I'm not sure I can. Oh, okay. I'm not sure I can see it, but I'm not oh, sure. I'm okay. Um, 
Oh, I can see that slideshow now, Adele. Uh, so, can you see the Ozplay video? No. No. Okay. I will now try again. Sorry. I can everybody. see the Sport and Rec slideshow now. Okay. I'm going to make that smaller. All right. That's fine. Obviously, my um, yeah, the screen that I'm calling screen two is actually screen one. So desktop one. Here we go. I think we now have it. Yep, that's it. Can All see right. It now. I'm very sorry. Here we go. Thanks, Steph. Just letting you know there's no sound on the video and also some people are off mute. Yeah, I'll, I'll sort of talk about it. I think the main thing is looking at some of those graphs and we okay. can have a quick chat about that too and I'll take any questions. I can send that around, Adele. Right. I guess um, the the reason why I wanted to show some of that um, is we've just released our Ausplay data, uh, which is the early impact of COVID on sport uh, and physical activity. So I, one, some of the graphs were just um, giving an explanation um, of some of the, the key findings, which is um, things like the participation uh, rate of people doing just exercise and participation as opposed to sport um, has decreased. Um, there's um, a bit of, I guess, fear of what might be next for sport and when people may come back into sport. Um, there's some information there around uh, gender uh, and females and males participating back into sport uh, and particularly with children. So we found that um, most adults um, would be doing some kind of uh, physical activity or sport over the COVID period and coming back into it, but children are less so. Um, and, you know, there's probably extrapolation there of uh, not having school and having the, the sporting schools and activities through school that children aren't, aren't getting those figures. And it's, it's actually quite low, um, around sort of 20% as opposed to 80% uh, of, of adults that were doing some kind of physical activity um, what we found in the last, in this one is that instead of sport coming up high and people's, um, the reasons why you do sport, that sort of social activity, physical exercise, it's more around the mental health 
uh, and wellbeing. And I think um, you know, through COVID, that's been something that we've certainly spoken a lot about for mental health and particularly with athletes uh, as well. So having that, you know, the exercise and, um, you know, even getting outside. Many of my colleagues um, have been in, in Melbourne, uh, Victoria, and just even, you know, sort of getting to the park across the road or seeing some sunshine and actually being able to go um, longer than five kilometres around your house has been, you know, I guess, a priority as opposed to going out on a Saturday and playing sport. Um, so we've had we had some of those findings and I guess, um, you know, there's the overall, as I was saying, activity um, to participation. So, you know, it's a focus for us around getting uh, people back into sport. Um, there's some evidence around um, the reasons for people moving from sport to participation. You know, it's quite simple just to get your family, um, get on a bike or go for a walk. Uh, and that's, you know, considered sort of your exercise and finding your 30 um, in that space, as opposed to having, um, you know, half your day where you're driving around um, dropping kids off and I'm certainly in that in that basket as well of you know getting out in the mornings when it's I mean I'm in Canberra um, when it's minus five and you know sitting in the watching sport for sort of two or three hours um, as opposed to going as a family and doing some of that exercise so we're seeing a little bit of that um, coming through in that participation so we're just looking at it, there's lots of discussions around how you can increase um, that participation in sport um, the experience, there's um, a number of initiatives around hybrid sports. So you may not play the full sport for a certain amount of time. Um, there's uh, some evidence now around esports. So um, what you didn't see there is just the, the high increase in um, what we're calling esports. So esports now these days is not just gamers, um, it's Lots of different things. I don't know if people had seen um, rowing. There were certainly a lots of indoor rowing, lots of big competitions, um, and they've made um, that you know quite quite big on their agenda now in terms of you know that indoor rowing, um, the the car racing, the um, the animated of the car racing was extraordinary um, for me to, to look and see that you know it actually looked really similar. Um, uh, to, to watch that car race as opposed to, to going out and, you know, getting somewhere and driving and spending all that money um, to, to see the car races. Uh, we're looking, I guess, from a sporting perspective as well, is, is just that experience over experience that people have with sport. So when you go and join a sport, um, what that engagement looks like, what your coaching looks like, what the officiating looks like, um, who's volunteering to help you. There's evidence which you may not have seen in there um, about the decline in volunteering. So we've got a, a big focus around how do we get people back into volunteering for sport um, and participation. Um, and so there's yeah lots of different um, you know things that we're finding around uh, with COVID. So you know for us it's a real focus on you know getting people back into participating in sport and whether that's know a hybrid sport or how that um, you know might look like in the future for us around uh, that traditional kind of sport in the next couple of months will be quite telling for us. So I'm happy to take questions now or you would you're going to take them after aren't you Simone? Oh, we can take a, a, one, a couple of questions now and then you know if there are more later on. Um, yeah I, really I can send we have, have a sound. sound. Yeah. Yeah that's all right. We have a full report. Um, if people are interested, I can send that. Um, and also that video, it's only three minutes, but it just gives you an understanding of the impact of COVID for, for sport uh, in Australia and some of it in, in the global uh, context as well. I think, uh, Riley, do you have a question? Or we just, um, yeah, we can. I we was can... just saying that'd be great to get the report and the video. Thank you. It's, it's really yes. good. My colleagues and I are doing similar research so I'll keep in touch about that so yeah you. absolutely yeah pleasure great and yeah I've shared the YouTube uh, link in the chat and we can share the report as well um, okay we will thank you so much Emma we'll take more questions later on and now we'll move to uh, Queensland with um, Sarah and Tiani Hi. Yep. Hello. Can you see us? Oh, there. Hi. Can you see us? No. No, you're definitely not muted. I can see your voice. 
No, we can hear you. you can hear us. It's just yeah. not about us. <laughs> That's all right. I'll get the um, slide yeah. deck up. Yeah, we'll get a slide deck up, but we'll just. Um... Hi, my name is Sarah Lovell, and I'm here with Tiani. We're um, the acting directors in the, I guess, the policy programs and um, partnerships area of sport and recreation. Um, so we're going to run through, I guess, our policy response to COVID-19. Um, but firstly, I guess um, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners on the lands on which we all meet. And in line with the theme of NAIDOC week of always was, always will be, I acknowledge um, leaders past, present and emerging. Um, so firstly, I guess we wanted to talk a bit about how we got to our um, policy and our programmatic response to COVID-19 and the impact it had on the sport and recreation industry. And for us, it was um, quite apparent that what is particularly interesting is in the way in which we had to rapidly respond, uh, develop our policy position and program response and try and look at what data and research and real inputs we could include into how we could, I guess, develop a, a best practice frame around our, our policy response. Obviously, in a perfect world, the policy cycle is relatively smooth and, and it works swimmingly and, and it goes straight through and achieves um, significant outcomes in the community. Um, but unfortunately, we're not in a perfect world and you generally find that there's a non-linearity of this process and there's a need to be a bit more agile and responsive as we move through um, a policy and program cycle. So for us, I guess what was extraordinary in our response to COVID was the extent to which we had to be agile and responsive to, I guess, face um, help the industry face the issues in terms of particularly the lockdown, the almost non-existence of industry um, activity and what that meant to Queenslanders and then how we could, um, I guess, help them to uh, return back to normal as, as quickly as possible. So for, for the moment, we'll just talk a little bit about our journey on that. So Queensland Government um, declared public health emergency on the 29th of January 2020, following an increased federal government restrictions on international arrivals through the month of February, the federal government announced the formation of the National Cabinet on 13th of March. And for most of you, you obviously know the background of how we got to that point. And just a few days before its announcements on social distancing rules, which was the 15th of March. And that was a significant, I guess, effect on how people could move around and, and gather. And, and that was where there was a restriction of banning groups of more than 500. So obviously for the sport and rec industry, and particularly as you move into professional sport and large scale events, having um, the ability to not host up to, you know, over 500 people has a significant impact financially, um, socially, and I guess um, in their planning space of what they want to run in terms of activity. Um, so on the 13th of March, when National Cabinet, Cabinet was formed, we were preparing for our first Broncos and Cowboys game at the newly completed Townsville um, Queensland Country Bank Stadium which is part of the stadium's Queensland portfolio, um, which is part of, the, I guess, is the statutory authority that we uh, have responsibility for in, in sport and recreation. So for us, that was a momentous event because I guess that was the last time they could even think about having um, people at a, a large scale um, uh, gathering. So this is, a, so um, collectively that meant that there was a lot um, of, a big impact on watching sport and being able to even be a fan of any, um, sporting events. So what we had to look at is what was the industry prior to COVID-19 and what, and then, sorry, prior to COVID-19 and the impact it had. So the morning of 13th of March was also the planned meeting of the Sport and Recreation Ministers or MISRAM is what we call them. Um, so that, I guess, is uh, where the jurisdiction, the ministers for each of the state and territory jurisdictions and the Australian government um, gather to uh, talk about policy and um, how they might work and collaborate better together, or where there are specific issues around sport that um, they need to look at, where does that join up at a national and or state collaborative level. Um, as a foreshadowing of the pivoting course correction that would need to be done in the months to come, on the day of the misroom, we needed to pivot the whole agenda of the national sport and recreation um, direction and consider the latest information on the COVID-19 pandemic plan. There was an update on COVID-19 provided by the Chief Nursing and Midwifery Office, Officer from the Federal Government Department of Health, and all sports ministers agreed to continue to be guided by the Australian Health Protection Principle Committee about the implication of, implications of the pandemic for public gatherings and sporting events. 
That also started the process of rapidly shifting the existing interjurisdictional collaboration through the Committee of Australia Sport and Recreation Officials. Now, these are representatives of departments, so the actual government um, heads of sport and recreation jurisdictions. Um, and, that, and they support um, and share insights and learnings and policy responses to COVID-19 and ascertain how to best support sport and recreation in Australia. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Hi, um, we're just tag team. We're tag team. Um, <laughs> I'm Tiana Manhar and I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional owners on of the land on which we meet. For us, that's the Turrbal people. Uh, I guess moving on from what Sarah talked about and um, Mizram and Kazro and I don't know who is across what is happening in that space, but with the formation of National Cabinet, they did a complete uh, review of all of those um, COAG and non-COAG meetings, which have meant that um, it's been recommended that Misram uh, are one of the meetings that will be disbanded um, and all, all of that formal arrangement will come to a close by the 1st of February next year. Um, but moving back in time um, to March, <laughs> so really when we're thinking about um, how, how we kind of work with people and when our industry has effectively ground to a halt, um, and we've never been in a situation where we've had to stop or restart an industry before. So we began by talking to our stakeholder groups and reaching for any data that we had that could provide an idea as to the most likely impacts of the pandemic on those industry. Because for us, obviously, the industry is our bigger, biggest lever to pull on in relation to um, Queenslanders being able to participate. So we work with and support directly or indirectly a, a diverse range of stakeholders and we needed a nuanced mapping of stakeholders and the potential and actual impacts on them. So that is talking about individuals, you know, individual Queenslanders, um, encouraging lifelong participation for all, community level clubs and organisations which are largely volunteer based, state level sport and active recreation organisations, the industry peak bodies, elite athletes like the um, Queensland Academy of Sport athletes and um, obviously our stadium portfolio, as Sarah mentioned before, um, and sort of all of the diverse groups that sort of sit around that. We also, um, one of our key changes was working with new um, stakeholders, including um, the fitness industry and across government with Queensland Health to sort of stand up a quick response to how Queensland can return to play and have equity of access to diverse opportunities um, to allow all stakeholders, to allow all Queenslanders access to that. Um, so we really needed to lean into establish and new working relationships and to be able to gauge the trajectory as each new, the impacts of each new impact or relief measure um, was revealed. So what we kind of tried to do very quickly was undertake research and consultation on multiple fronts. And Sarah's going to talk about that a little bit more. So for us, it was about rapidly bringing all sorts of, wait a minute, <laughs> all sorts of information together so that we could kind of work out what our policy response needed to be. So obviously that was around undertaking research and consultation on multiple fronts to, under, to understand the likely synergistic impacts in the, from global all the way to local levels. Um, to facilitate our understanding of the, of the issues around COVID, we needed to bring the industry and look at how we could get a range of information sharing, research activities and consultation practices together, including lit reviews, so undertaking lit reviews that would provide insights on previous disasters, including pandemics and their impacts on individuals, community and organisations and drawing on insights from multiple disciplines, including history, anthropology, sociology, and psychology. So even an example is um, the Spanish flu. So obviously for something like that, what was the recovery? How did that happen? What was the way that happened? Um, also, how, how would um, everyday Queenslanders be affected and what was their response to lockdown and the risk? How do local clubs rel reliant on volunteer workforce weather the storm? What's the level of trust in the public health expertise in these environments? Will communities come together or be more fractured by the pandemic? How do we drive the inclusion in sport and broader society so that when we are able to get back together and gather, what's the ways that we can get people to um, respond to that and be more engaged in the community? And what was the appetite for returning to grassroots sports, all those major sporting events during uh, after a pandemic? As well as that, the Miserum and Casro cross-jurisdictional intel sharing. So as I said, 
looked at some of the work that other agencies were doing across Australia, um, as well as uh, you know sharing knowledge, sharing information, um, looking at where we've done questionnaires together, what are some of the responses. And as Emma showed before, the Ausplay data was also, while it was a bit later in, in for us, um, obviously some of that stuff is important to measure before the pandemic and then as we move out of um, the different stages of restrictions. Also key stakeholder forums and as Tiani said, working closely with council, state level organisations and state of Queensland and Queensland Health to see what was um, the, I guess, the, the frame that we had to work within. And then a coalition, collation of other initiatives. What do we know? What we, um, I guess, look at the analysis of gaps and an identification of complementary measures so that we weren't necessarily replicating what another agency was doing or what the federal government was doing, such as JobKeeper and JobSeeker or small business grants. What were the other levers that we could use to actually look at how we can support the industry? Um, I mean, we knew that many clubs and state level organisations would need support to meet ongoing costs, such as maintenance of playing fields and buildings. So even while they're shut down, they still had these expenses that they needed to be able to cover and looking at ways that we could potentially support they, those measures. Um, we also had the economic impacts analysis on state level organisations and found that there's a high variation in financial health and sustainability. And that highlighted some of the need to bring forward some payments to the state level organisations prior to, uh, prior to I guess, our investment that we usually um, give them in terms of financial support. So looking at how we could, bet, we could better support them as they were, um, were moving through the, the crisis. Um, and then I get, yeah, I guess the other part is about what are the, some of the governance issues that we need to look at and how, how we can help the industry to move through these processes. Yeah, that's yeah. So then this is a bit of a synthesis. synthesis I, I'm not gonna try that again. Um, <laughs> this is how it all kind of wove together and I guess this is how our response played out. So a key initiative during the early stages of the lo lockdown was Boost Your Healthy, which is a social ma marketing campaign which was targeted at Queenslanders. Um, there were um, inspirational um, ambassadors from a right um, spectrum of ages, you know, all the way up to Dylan Fraser, and we also used some of our QAS athletes um, who were obviously, you know, in a situation where they had been preparing for Tokyo and you know, they were, they were also not feeling very resilient. So, you know, by using them in this kind of manner, they actually felt like they had a contribution and it was a really positive outcome. Um, there was a high level of community engagement in that community, in that um, campaign and we are still working with Health and Wellbeing Queensland who are uh, a different agency on, on what's the next stage um, to lean into um, based on that success. Um, when we entered stage two in May, we published the Return to Play Guide, which is pivotal in providing communication to both industry and individuals on how to interpret what was then the 20 group limit with full social distancing measures in place in sport, active recreation, fitness settings. Um, and the guide became the highest visited page other than the roadmap on the state government COVID page. The guide builds on the national principles um, but really provides specific advice to both organisations and individuals on how to um, basically operate. And that continued to be updated as we've moved through um, lesser restrictions um, to provide a central, I guess, um, point of truth. Uh, we've also, to support that, set up a COVID hotline and email um, thing and mobilised our whole service delivery team to be able to provide on the ground support to community organisations on how to interpret um, all of those guides to be able to return to play safely so that Queenslanders are not at all at that risk from being uh, able to be active, but also that, um, you know, because of the volunteer nature of it, they kind of need an extra bit of support on how to set up, it, especially at the beginning. Um, so we've really sort of um, engaged. So with stage three came the introduction of um, COVID safe industry plans, which is were developed in collaboration with people bodies for sport, uh, recreation and fitness to ensure the safe return to play. And the engagement between both government and industry and within the industry was highly collaborative on these um, documents and brought a lot of stakeholders along for the journey while responses were in development. So that when we were communicating within the industry, it was also reflective of that spirit of collaboration um, in a similar vein, we established a return to play advisory subcommittee, which provide guidance and advice on resumption of activity in sport, recreation and fitness, including the professional league codes. So that members include um, 
Queensland Health, industry peak bodies, union represents it representatives and Stadiums Queensland. By establishing that body, we were able to mobilise existing multi-sectorial advisory body to expedite um, informed decision-making um, and also ease some of the burden on Queensland Health and in particular the Chief Health Officer um, by taking on some of that um, coordination and facilitation and engagement roles. Um, so in the end, following all of the analysis and research and consultation that we undertook, we were able to provide, um, we were able to seek government approval on the COVID safe restart plan, which included kickstart grants of up to $2,000 for 7,000 eligible community sport and recreation clubs for um, safe return to play for things like hygiene supplies um, and to ensure that they were operationally ready the Active Restart Infrastructure Recovery Fund for minor capital works and revenue generating equipment to reactivate communities um, with the fundraising effort of the community volunteers would have otherwise been made possible. And that was, you know, in response to things like funding, um, sausage officials not being able to be there and a whole lot of um, sponsorship opportunities not being available within the industry. Um, we had a special round of fair play vouchers um, with which are vouchers of up to 150 dollars for up to 73,000 young Queenslanders to participate in activities and to support families who are struggling because of the COVID-19. And we brought forward payments to state level organisations, as Sarah said. Um, all of that happened after consultation with um, peak bodies and state level organisations, advice from the Return to Play Committee, um, ongoing consultation with local governments, insights from other Australian jurisdictions, and the collaborative um, impact of the Miserum and, and CASRO um, mechanisms, um, consultation with the Queensland Academy of Sport and um, an independent review, which Sarah mentioned before, of the sport and recreation at the state level organisations. Queensland also became the hub of professional sporting activity, which included teams from NRL, Netball, Full Seeds and, and various AFL teams relocating to Queensland. And they had a twofold impact on our agency, uh, one was the uh, assuming the responsibility for triaging and managing all of the state um, uh, sport-related inquiries on behalf of Queensland Health, but we also have been working with uh, Department of State Development, Tourism and Innovation and all of the professional leagues about how to best leverage the societal and, impact, and economic impacts um, for Queensland on, on how, you know, the benefits of having those professional and elite sports um, coming to Queensland. So I guess really our key lessons, when we summarise that all up, our key lessons for, from our response for COVID is um, to make sure that we have a really broad range of data inputs to be able to re, um, respond to, which includes research and consultation and um, you know, any kind of survey or data input mechanism we can find and to be able to check what support is missing and how policy responses can best address any gaps. Um, we've been really willing to lean into that new partners and stakeholders as the situation evolves. And we've helped, we've found that that really has helped us achieve our ultimate outcome. Um, we've done rapid course correction and iteration processes um, and taken that as our approach to respond to crises. And that will also help us how to respond to the crises, but also keep in mind our ultimate goal, which is the strategic outcome of ensuring all Queenslanders can be and stay active over their lifetimes and that um, any group isn't disadvantaged in this pandemic. Um, and we really find that a key facilitator of that um, is the active industry and providing that support to the active industry um, to ensure that it remains viable and responsive to demand and can get back to doing what it's doing best. And I uh, flippantly said to Sarah earlier that I, you know, I think our role is to mobilise the industry that mobilises people. Um, but really, in, a, in essence, that's kind of what we've tried to talk through today. So that's us. Thank you. Thanks so much. That was, that was really, really excellent. And uh, does anybody have any questions now or shall we, we can wait till the end? We'll move on and we'll, I have questions, but I think I'll just wait till the end. Without, um, we'll, we'll move on now to Professor Alison 
Doherty. Uh, her research focuses broadly on the management of nonprofit and community sport, particularly sport volunteerism, group dynamics and organisational capacity and innovation. Recent projects have included the investigation of social capital and psychological contract in the volunteer youth sport coaching environment and organisational capacity for gender equity in sport initiatives. Alison is the lead of the Sport and Social Impact Research Group at Western University and a board member of Canada's Sport Information Resource Centre. In addition to her own coaching, Alison mentors apprentice coaches through the Coaching Association of Ontario's Change the Game program. And we're really happy to have her here today. Thank you very much, Adele. I have done a screen share, so uh, let me know if that is not um, showing. Sure, working great. Okay, thank you. Um, so we've heard uh, about some uh, sport policy responses uh, that have been going on in the return and recovery phase and, and looking in a post-pandemic world. Um, and I would like to focus on uh, the community sport uh, responses. And uh, by community sport, I mean the uh, member-based nonprofit clubs uh, that are, um, there's certainly a a uh, wide range of those in our communities and, and in our countries and uh, both in Canada and Australia. And so uh, before we uh, think about a post-pandemic world, I think it's really important to consider uh, what these uh, community sport clubs are doing now and, and where they may be heading next. And I just want to provide a bit of context that uh, perhaps the community sport context may be one of the biggest unknowns in a post-pandemic world. And anybody who's working in that context may agree with that. So we know what's happening in, in restaurants that, uh, you know, how many they can take and what the rules are. But it seems to be really fluctuating in sport. At least that's the situation in Canada. So community sport is... Uh, organized, we're talking about organized sport, there are rules, uh, there's typically competition. These are things that are uh, set in place and certainly have been long standing. Um, it is uh, voluntary uh, based, uh, nonprofit, uh, reliant on members. Um, often relied on, reliant on shared facilities and certainly in Canada this is the case and this is one of the biggest challenges is that sport clubs are um, relying on shared facilities but they can't access those facilities such as municipalities and uh, schools and universities and colleges that have uh, set restrictions on outside users. Um, there's an expectation that community sport will be a source of individual and community physical activity and well-being. So a lot of pressures on sport. At the same time, it's expected to be a pathway to elite sport. Um, so within this context, we can consider whether community sport can or will pivot um, or even shift, maybe not so much as a pivot, which we get a sense of about 180 degrees, um, but maybe even a shift to a new normal. Can it do that? And can it, and will it even survive at all? Of course, community sport will survive, but will certain clubs survive? And what are the challenges they're um, experiencing? So what I want to suggest, uh, start by suggesting is that we lean on evidence and it was great to hear from uh, Tiana and Sarah about the uh, research that they've been doing in Queensland. Uh, Emma talked about this as well. And I think this is really critical and particularly with the community sport club setting, we need to understand uh, what is going on uh, with these organizations. And uh, so in this presentation, I'm uh, going to uh, draw particularly on um, a um, uh, sorry, I'm just checking. I want to make sure that yes, thank you for uh, for sharing that, Adele. Uh, drawing on this uh, paper that I completed with colleagues Patty Miller and Katie Meisner, looking at return to sport and leaning on evidence in turbulent um, times. And in that, we argue that uh, you know there is existing empirical evidence and knowledge of the strengths and vulnerabilities, um, and and using this is critical to effectively recover, rebuild, and reinvent. Reinvent, and particularly if we're thinking about reinventing to a more uh, equitable, diverse, inclusive sport, uh, maybe a shift from competition, um, any kind of a pivot or even shift. And we need to think about what is the reality for these community sports clubs now and what might be the reality going forward. As well, this evidence can provide a, a platform, but maybe even a springboard, let's put a lot of uh, life into that, for new research to address new questions and 
hold of a more uh, resilient um, and sustainable community sports sector. So I just want to take a few minutes to draw on a few of these um, bits of evidence, if you will, that we can um, lean on um, to um, get a sense of uh, what is the reality for community sport clubs. And this has to do with assessing and building capacity, embracing innovation and adapting top-down directives. And these are all critical factors in uh, both the return to sport now and certainly uh, looking to a new normal in a post-pandemic world. So considerations for a new normal in, in sport and specifically community sport uh, around capacity um, it is the capacity of clubs um, to continue to return to sport, to recover. And I almost want to flip those around because clubs have returned to sport and they're focusing on recovering. Okay, we've, we've done it. We've got some players back on the field in the gym, but how are we actually going to recover from this and, uh, and reinvent themselves, uh, perhaps as, as uh, some advocates would suggest they should. This will depend on their ability to draw on critical resources. And research that I've done with colleagues and others have done um, uh, have identified uh, elements of human resources, finances, infrastructure, planning and development and external relationships. And we can consider, and we actually know uh, what pre-pandemic strengths and challenges are of these clubs. And it'll be important to know what are the return and recovery strengths and challenges? And are we seeing a shift in that? And in fact, we, we are. And what might be their future strengths and challenges in this new normal? Um, we can uh, think about um, the potential and the mechanism to build and rebuild capacity when we, where we see gaps in, in that, in uh, the return to sport and, and, and shifting and pivoting in sport. Um, and um, research indicates that this needs to be, this capacity building needs to be intentional, strategic and sustainable by sport clubs. Uh, that's identifying their capacity needs specifically. It depends on their readiness to build capacity and a readiness to sustain that built capacity. So this is what clubs are facing. If we look at innovation, uh, research tells us that uh, sport clubs will be the most commonly experienced and, and most uh, tolerant of incremental small changes that are typically around process and administration. So things like new staff or a member database, things that we might see as a small shift. Um, and so radical changes, a, a greater departure from existing practice and particularly to technical features and the product, ex product itself may require more, require more time, patience and support. So when we're talking about changing the fundamental nature of sport or asking clubs to reconfigure um, uh, their offerings and, and their product, um, this can be considered a radical change for a club. And so uh, it can be expected to require more time and, and, uh, and support. And a third consideration is top-down directives. And certainly that's what we're talking about. Uh, the uh, examples from both uh, Emma and um, Tiani and Sarah are about top-down coming from um, the uh, state and national levels. And it's important to recognize that clubs will balance and adapt directives with the rea realities of their local context and for the unique needs of their membership. So when they get directives, this is what you need to do to return to sport. This is what you should do in terms of embracing equity and diversity and inclusion and a different way of sport. They're going to adapt that to their local context and what their members are saying. And so considerations for effective implementation of these top-down directives are the club's awareness of specific details and their interpretation of that, um, their capacity to be able to make uh, these changes. And also a consideration of both driving and inhibiting economic, social, and political factors. And the bottom line in this is it's critical to uh, recognize that clubs are active agents with top-down directives when they're asked to implement policy. They don't, they won't just uh, do it uh, carte blanche and, and blindly, but they will adapt it to their own situation. Um, so I was asked to uh, maybe provide some examples uh, from Canada. And so here's some uh, current realities. 
Um, the number one issue besides uh, safety of uh, participants um, at, at all levels, the number one issue is the return of members. And this probably is not surprising given the uh, data that Emma was showing us. Um, so let's think about this from the club's perspective, not just what the individuals are doing, but what is the club facing? Um, so the return of members and serving their members who have certain expectations expectations um, of them. So the challenge is with coordinating who can participate, how can they participate, and where can they participate. This is what they're dealing with. Another reality is financial capacity. And, uh, but, but what is a new challenge for them is unstable revenues. So for the most part, clubs have not been challenged with their revenues, where they're member-based, they uh, have members show up and pay and they offer programs to them, but the members aren't showing up yet. They still have, the club still has the same expenses for um, facilities and additional expenses. So there's unstable revenues is a challenge infrastructure capacity, so the inaccessibility of facilities because um, where they are renting them, uh, leasing them from partners, they're saying, I'm sorry, you can't come in um, for the university, it says no uh, public uh, users, mun municipal facilities um, have closed down and some are just returning. Human resource capacity is a challenge. Um, and this has been mentioned uh, as well. And it's a continuity of volunteers is a main challenge. And of course, volunteers goes along with members because members are often the volunteers. So if the members aren't returning, then the volunteers aren't returning. So, so we're hearing the other side of the story with regard to these clubs. And another issue is around innovation. Innovation is around programming. Um, the clubs are not focused on innovation around equity, diversity, inclusion, and, and, and uh, changing their sport to a, a better form of sport. They're being innovative around um, getting, uh, coordinating who can participate, how they can participate, and where. And so these are their challenges. But um, the upside is that necessity is certainly the mother of invention. Um, we are seeing greater collaboration and even connection among clubs um, and with their partners. Um, the pandemic and, and presumably post-pandemic safety measures are aligning with uh, clubs' recent focus on a safe sport environment. And so they already had this um, uh, sort of culture of safe sport in mind. And so it's uh, been uh, a, a smoother um, adjustment to that than might have been expected. There's a renewed focus on financial efficiency because of the challenges with unstable revenues. Uh, another example is uh, we're seeing some combined age programming. And one stakeholder I spoke to said that they're seeing some interesting things, interesting behaviors in the 13 year olds when they're paired up with the nine year olds. They're really taking on a leadership role and they're seeing some really cool things happening. Um, in ice hockey in Canada, there's been restrictions on body checking. I'm not a huge fan of that. And so I, I'm happy to see that being taken out. And, and I think that it can take out and that may be a pivot that, uh, that is sustained. Um, there's restrictions on a soccer throw-in. So no hands on the ball. And so throw-ins are uh, being um, restricted. And so this is discouraging heading of the ball. And so we're seeing some safer sport in that way. And uh, a stakeholder also gave me an example of new safety measures that are just good practice. Um, he said this was in soccer. And he said, you know, it was really they should have been washing these pennies uh, all the time. And now they finally are. Uh, so the community sport responses, what might that be? Well, I would say that we can look to, uh, we can capture this in research. I think it would be great to understand how have clubs managed um, their return to sport, their recovery in sport. What are the best practices? We also need to know what were the worst practices? What do they want to keep going forward? And what can and does a new model of community sport look like? So when our uh, club stakeholders have the time to talk to us um, about some of these things, we should find out uh, what, has, what has worked, uh, what innovations have been positive and, and what can a new model look like for that? Uh, for policy and practice, um, it's critical to know what the sport delivery level looks like from all stakeholders' perspective. And uh, certainly um, 
uh, Tiani and Sarah talked about uh, speaking to clubs. Uh, we know a lot about what people want. We're hearing uh, this from our communities and from uh, families that what they want in sport, but it's important to know what the sport delivery uh, looks like. It's capacity, what it, innovation means, policy implementation. Uh, there's also research on collaboration at that level and to provide support for building capacity as needed, implementing innovative practices and adapting policy to clubs realities. Thank you so much. That was that was excellent. Um, we have one question from Tim now, which we'll take and then we'll move on to Simone. We're running out of time, of course. Um, oh, we might wait, Tim, till after Simone, and I'm sure that will be irrelevant to everybody. So I will now hand over to our chair of the SAGE group here, uh, Professor Simone Fulliger. Thanks very much, Adele, and what a fantastic range of speakers we've had. I'm just going to share my screen. Um, of course, we were ambitious, thinking we could fit all of this into one hour. <laughs> so hence why I'm going last, because I'll just shorten mine a little bit, because I'm going to pick up on many of the themes that people have already spoken about, which has been fantastic. I'm still trying to take it all in, as I'm sure you are. Um, we, Adele and I were fortunate to get a little bit of pilot funding from the university, from Griffith um, Arts, Education and Law faculty to look at uh, recovering from sport and fitness, the recovery of sport and fitness cultures in a post-COVID world. So we're particularly interested in um, looking at the impact that's both economic and, and emotional. We're interested in the effective dynamics of what the COVID pandemic is doing and how we can think about uh, equity and diversity in that context. And I would also like to acknowledge that it's made up week and um, the importance of acknowledging that we are all on Aboriginal land. And for me, it's the um, Yungumbe and Kumba Mary people on my campus. So it is fantastic to bring together um, everybody to talk about these issues and think about the way in which um, our research might contribute to some of these ongoing debates around policy and research relationships, which is why we're kind of all coming together. So this project, just to give you a brief overview, um, we're just starting it. So we've done uh, 12 interviews with uh, kind of key informants in the sport sector in Queensland. And we're doing um, some interviews with a case study around hockey, rural and urban and some gyms. We're really interested in looking at the way in which both providers of sport and participants are experiencing these shifting um, dynamic relations, both economic and uh, emotional, in relation to equity issues. So we are coming from a feminist perspective. We are looking at gender inequalities, but we're really thinking about that in an intersectional way. You know, we can't separate gender out from socioeconomic difference, culture, um, uh, sexuality, age, disability, all of these things come together. How much of that will be in this project? We'll see. But alongside the interviews, um, we are also going to use some creative methods and a, a time capsule uh, methodology where we're going to use some small focus groups, arts-based methods, a drawing, um, collage, a whole range of photography, things that we might use to draw out the deeper experiences so this is a complementary approach to say kind of the bigger data sets that um, policymakers often use because to understand the complexity of people's experiences will really help inform uh, more creative, innovative ways to address equity issues. So we really want to think about how to conceptualize equity from different perspectives. And what do we mean by that? And what does it mean in practice? Uh, I won't go through this slide, but it's just the an example of the growing evidence base around um, the exacerbation of inequality in society, for many societies globally um, and in sport. So we really want to highlight the, the structural inequalities against which uh, we have to think about the implication for sport. So there are kind of three things I was going to talk about today, but I'll probably go to straight to the final one. So the major challenges and changes from, that um, sports stakeholders are identifying and then the lessons learned. 
the innovations, the challenges, but also what are the creative responses and what can we learn from this in terms of how sport can address this question of what a new normal looks like and how can sport be fair for all? How can it be uh, thinking about equity and diversity as core business? So I'll just skip those couple of slides because of time. And I just want to kind of say that I'll focus on hockey. Um, it's been, we chose hockey because it's, uh, it has gender equity in terms of its, its participation. Um, and they've had a quite a big impact in terms of what we've been able to gather um, so far. So lost many divisions and also many women's and girls teams in those divisions. Uh, there've been some social competitions offered um, but there has been a great loss and also a sense of a lack of female volunteers or women volunteers. So there's risk of losing participants uh, to other recreations or sports. And in Queensland, we can, we know there's been a, a boost in AFL participation. So that's interesting given the um, elite level uh, of um, performance that's happened here. And of Hockey Australia have also talked about their inclusion strategy. They have something ready to go, but it requires funding. So this whole um, interplay around the political and the investment in sport is the kind of big question on the table. They also found they were, had some downtime during this hiatus, so they could work on the transgender policy that was linked to Sport Australia's um, framework. So they acknowledge there's a lot to do around um, developing greater strategies to address diversity. Other people mentioned um, the impact on older people and children in particular because of the reduced social contact. Um, and the upside was a greater collaboration across the sports sector and with government. So producing positive ways of working in the crisis. So this uh, notion of the pivot and developing different forms of collaborative um, working is really an important foundation for thinking about how equity and diversity um, issues can be built into those ongoing conversations that have already begun. Uh, acknowledging that a crisis mode was entirely necessary to actually just get um, support going, support uh, for sport going again and the importance of maintaining that um, community sport infrastructure and provision. So there are very different views coming out or, or maybe they're complementary, but again, we're teasing them out around this notion of response. Is it a return to normal sport as some people have been talking about, getting back to the way things were? sport as it was known? Or is it actually a reinvention of sport that's responsive to a new normal in our society where inequities are being, can be addressed with a greater awareness and strategy to prevent what is occurring across uh, the world and, and in the country here in terms of a greater disparity in terms of access to the benefits of sport. These benefits are increasingly being recognised um, health benefits and mental health in particular. Uh, and th there are gender dimensions to that too. They're important to research and understand. But the, the disparity that's occurring will only increase in the terms of sport access if inequality isn't addressed in explicit ways. So if we just keep promoting sport the way we've always done it, we could in fact just be promoting it to the people who are more in a more privileged position and therefore widening inequality. So that's a pretty sobering thought. So this is tied up with a greater recognition of the changing norms that are occurring around gender, around uh, racialized identities and the structural inequalities. And we are certainly seeing that um, occurring around Black Lives Matter movements, lots of um, public and social media engagement around these issues of difference. So there's a question here I'd like to end with, which is really about how can we kind of bring researchers policymakers, practitioners, uh, activists together to have greater dialogue about how research and data in its fullness, complexity, can inform innovative knowledge practices and different ways of providing, promoting sport, structuring sport, organising sport, uh, thinking about different models, and whose knowledge matters in this um, process. How are we engaging with diverse voices to inform a more you know, a nuanced, um, an ongoing reflective process um, as we go through. All right, I'll stop there because I'm really keen for us to have some questions. I know we've just run over time, but I'll throw back to Adele in case you want to offer anything further. Thank you so much.
We are out of time. So of course, if people need to leave now, thank you so much for coming. This will be recorded. So you'll be able to pick up where you left off if you want to listen further. But we might take um, just a, a handful of questions. We'll definitely stop at 11.10. And of course, Emma and Sarah and Tiani, if you need to leave too, perfectly understandable considering we scheduled just till now. So there is a question from Tim uh, that he posted while Alison was speaking. He says that you made a comment on where clubs, clubs are innovating but do you have a view on where associations are innovating and perhaps encouraging clubs to innovate? Uh, thanks for the question. And uh, it brings up an interesting point. Um, uh, from the um, uh, article, which was uh, made available on open access, um, and this is about club sport. Uh, we had an inquiry from a provincial or the equivalent of a state association. And uh, they were wanting to know um, if we could give them some guidance on um, pivoting to a new normal, basically, which is what we're talking about. And so that's so that is happening at the association level, essentially. So and, and we're hearing about this. We heard about this from uh, Tiani and Sarah that at the um, at the state level, uh, there's a lot going on and thinking about um, what can we do differently and, you know, how can we pivot on this and what are the policies looking like and what are the directives and those sorts of things. And so what we have to recognize is uh, that this has to be a multi level process. So when uh, Simone says, you know, whose knowledge matters. Well, all levels of knowledge matter. I was thinking in my head, well, it's actually the clubs themselves. It's their knowledge that matters, but that's not true because they're getting uh, direction and insight uh, from the uh, state and federal levels. But the state and federal levels have to recognize um, some of the challenges that these uh, clubs are facing to uh, be starting to implement uh, some of these things. So what are associations doing? What are, uh, and, and at the provincial and state levels doing? We've heard about some of these things that they're uh, trying to move to um, more inclusive sport and those sorts of things. And um, so it remains to be seen whether clubs are innovating that way. And I think it'll be really important to understand um, it's, it provides a little um, microcosm of, uh, you know, microsystem to see the uh, connection between the uh, club level and um, the state level to see how that goes, to see how that innovation and the expectation for that um, trickles down and is it actually taken up at the club level. Thanks, Alison. Um, we have a question from Andrew. Uh, and he asked, are there any examples of organized slash community sport modifying their weekend sport experience to accommodate for the shift being seen to more family physical activity? Um, uh, Alison or anyone else? Yeah. So I, I can uh, comment on that. Um, I mean, I, I don't know uh, for sure, but what I would say is that um, I, I, I don't believe that the clubs are shifting because people are saying we want um, some, you know, a, a different experience on the weekend. The clubs are saying, how do we get people back on the pitch, on the field, in the gym? That is what they are saying. If someone interprets that as, oh, they're, they're ha they have new offerings. They're just doing what they can to get people participating again. And um, with some exceptions, um, to this, uh, there's probably not a lot of intentionality around and, you know, let's create a, a program, like let's create a program for combined ages. It's out of necessity that they're doing that because they only have, you know, maybe a quarter, maybe a third of the registration, but they're allowed to have 25 people on the field. So we're going to take the 15 that we have in the U13 group, and we're going to take the 10 that we have in the U9 group and look, we've been able to put those kids on the field. So it wasn't that this would be a great idea to combine the ages. It's just, this is how they can actually coordinate and make them happen. So there probably are exceptions, you finished? To that, but we have to recognize that um, clubs mm -hmm. are the first and foremost thing is to uh, support okay. their members, and to offer their sport. 
Thanks, Alison. Um, we've got two more questions in it. I think we should probably wrap up, even though I have questions too. But um, uh, so Aurelie uh, asked, do Tiani, Tiani and Sarah have data on the impact of the financial investment and program that have been implemented as part of the COVID restart plan? Hey, um, so we just put a, a response in the chat. Oh, great. Thank you. Yeah, because that, what we've done is we're at the stage of, you know, providing the investment to the organisations um, and then we'll be doing some survey responses and asking them what the impact has been, what they expect the short-term outcomes have been so far, and then obviously further on is the longer-term outcomes. So at this point, we don't have a full, I guess, um, we don't have the data yet of the impact of the investment, but it's kind of rolling out over the next six to 12 months. Yeah, I guess anecdotally, we do yeah. know that a vast majority of organisations have stood back up in Queensland. I think we're operating about 95% are back up. Yeah, so, yeah, so it's, it's an ongoing, I guess. And, and, and I guess for us, it's then forming what's the next policy shift and the next investment that we need to um, look at in terms of um, supporting clubs. And, and as you were saying, as um, Alison was saying, I think is that what's the reframing of sport and the industry and what does it need to, I guess, um, do to become more resilient in the future? What are the um, opportunities that we need to look at in terms of that pivoting and that, you know, innovation and what, what is it that will draw people back into playing? Thank you so much. So uh, we really appreciate you coming and your time yes. today. And so I apologize we were quite long with our presentation. <laughs> oh, it, it was it was just so good to hear it all and hear the whole kind of journey. Um, yeah. yeah. But yeah. Thank you. So, thank, thank you. you. Um, we've got a final question here, but feel free uh, for Sarah and Tiana to go um, from Alana, and she's interested to hear insights in terms of research into worst practice um, and. Yeah, so you can see that chat there. Sure, uh, so I can comment on that. Uh, that's interesting, Alana, that you took worst practices to mean maybe illegal practices. <laughs> I didn't mean it that way, um, but no, or non-compliance by organizations. Uh, by worst practice, I just, I threw that in on the slide because we always talk about best practices and what worked, but, you know, we should also find out what didn't work, especially in these very unique times. Uh, you know, an organization may say, well, we actually tried to partner with another club and that did not work at all. I think that's important to know as opposed to just knowing what did work. But so what did they try? Uh, maybe some innovations that they tried and, and those didn't work. Uh, but the, the issue of um, uh, non-compliance is uh, quite interesting. I have a student who's doing an autoethnography of his coaching experience during COVID. And uh, when I touched base with him in, um, I think it was July, and it was early days of them getting onto a field, and he was talking about them sneaking onto the field, and he didn't know if he should put that in his autoethnography. <laughs> so anyway, that remains to be seen whether uh, that is uh, put in there, but um, it, it also brings up an interesting point about non-compliance. Thank you. Uh, we will go. I mean, I, I wanted to maybe just make a comment how, just in terms of we're seeing this real steady increase in non-sport uh, related physical activity being reported on by Ausplay and being discussed by the sport governing bodies. And yet Fitness Australia, which kind of supports gyms and boot camps and trainers, is you know, completely separate and a very casualized workforce, a lot of women, so there's uh, some gendered impacts there. And, you know, I'm really curious to see as we continue to see a rise in non-club or more informal activities where Fitness Australia or um, trainers, uh, you know, personal trainers and people like that will fit in the broader sport ecology. But we have run out of time and, I will look forward to seeing everybody next year. We've got a really range of excellent seminars lined up and on, a, on some different topics, including uh, mental health and recovery, uh, the Women's World Cup coming to Queensland soon and um, uh, leadership and women as well. So thank you everybody for your support this year. And thank you especially to Alison for coming along at whatever time it is right now in Canada. That was really, really great to hear that. So thank you everyone.